that uh, he took every opportunity to share the gospel with people. He got a chance to share with the leading philosophers of the city of Athens. And, and hey, gee whiz, that was the hotbed of philosophy to the point that even today, 2,000 years after Paul, and longer than that, after some of the philosophers who had been um, part of the Greek philo philosophical explosion, uh, they still impact the world today with the things that our governments are like, our law, uh, the legal systems are like around the world, <clears throat> and, um, and the way philosophy is. Well, anyway, he got a chance to share with leading philosophers of that city, and some of them mocked him because he was talking about Jesus. It was a new thing to them. He, some delayed making a decision, and some used that excuse of a delay just to blow him off. But as preaching wasn't fruitless, some people in Athens did come to faith in Jesus, including one of the judges of that philosophical court, whose name was Dionysius, Dionysius or however you pronounce his name. So we're going to take a look at <clears throat> what happened to Paul after that. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 18. He's now leave, he's left Athens after bearing fruit there. And uh, let's see what happens. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he, he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house, named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul <clears throat> in the night by a vision, be not afraid, but speak, and hold not your peace. For I am with you, and no man shall set on you to hurt you, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So we'll stop and we'll, we'll pick up after that if we get that far today. <coughs> Excuse me. So Paul leaves Athens and he goes to Corinth. It wasn't that far a trip, but it was uh, south on the um, isthmus there of, in Greece. But it was a big city. There were about 250,000 people at that time. The population of Corinth um, in that uh, in, in 51 A.D. It was the capital city of that province of Achaia, and in Paul's day, it was already an ancient city. Corinth had been around for a long time. It was a commercial center with two harbors and a long-standing rivalry with Athens, where from which he had just come <clears throat> to the north. But Corinth had a widespread reputation for, let me say, loose living, especially sexual immorality. In classical Greek, Greek culture, they even used the phrase to act like a Corinthian, which meant to practice fornication. And the phrase a Corinthian companion meant a prostitute. That's how bad the reputation of this city was from a morality standpoint. Um, there was a big worship of the uh, Greek goddess Aphrodite, which was very popular because sexual uh, contact was part of the worship service, if you will. She was the goddess of fertility and sexuality. Of course, that was very popular <clears throat> among people. But about 100 and, oh, I'd say 200 years before Paul, Corinth had rebelled against Rome and it was destroyed. Rome just destroyed it. And for 100 years, it just lay in ruins. Until Julius Caesar, you know, he wasn't just a guy in a play. He rebuilt the city and he quickly reestablished its former position as a center for trade because of where it sat. But it also, its 
old reputation for immorality of every sort grew up almost worse than before. One ancient writer described Corinth as a town where none but the tough could survive. Sounds like a lot of cities in our country, but <clears throat> I suspect it was worse. Well, here we are in 51 AD. I'll tell you how we know it was 51 AD a little later in our study today. And Paul arrives in the city of Corinth, a very prosperous place. Um, it occupied the entire width of the isthmus there in Greece, um, just south of Athens. And it was a place where the Isthmian Games, like the Olympic Games, were held in Corinth. Now, the Isthmian, there were four types of Olympic Games back in those days. The Olympics, the ancient Olympics were the big one. <clears throat> but the Isthmian Games were one of the three smaller ones, and they were held in the year immediately following the Olympics, and the year just prior to the Olympics, there was a third set of games that went on in between, um, because sport and competition was very uh, popular. They even included music at one point in the Olympic Games. Anyway, Corinth also had a large Jewish colony, and as usual, Paul went first to the chief synagogue where he preached Jesus to the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, came to Corinth, verse 1, found a certain Jew named Aquila who was born in Pontus. Paul knew um, that because people from all over the Roman Empire passed through Corinth, uh, a strong church there could touch the lives of people all over the Roman Empire. He also knew ahead of time that Corinth was a tough city. It had a reputation. But he wasn't interested only in planting churches where it was easy to plant churches. He was interested in sharing Jesus with the world. That was his goal. So Corinth really was, a, from a strategic standpoint, was a good place for this, even though it was a tough place. Now remember, Paul's alone. <clears throat> he was without his team in Athens. He was still waiting for Silas and Timothy when he got to Corinth. In fact, uh, the, the fact that Paul was alone possibly accounts for why he baptized any converts at all. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, when he writes a letter back to this church in Corinth that it hasn't been founded yet in our uh, study today, but it will be, and he will write a letter back to them. He's saying, guys, why are you arguing about who, who, who baptized who? Some say, I am of Paul. Some say, I, have, I am of Apollos. Some say I am of Cephas. He says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you except a few. And he did, and we'll talk about those guys today. And in verse 2, it tells us he met this Jewish guy by the name of Aquila, from, born in Pontus, who has lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. Aquila was a Jewish believer. Uh, he was this... Pontus area, we'll talk about in just a second, ties back to Acts chapter 2. You might want to flip back there to the day of Pentecost. And at some time in his life, he'd moved to Italy. Don't know why, maybe he just wanted to get to the big city. In any case, he had recently arrived in Corinth with his wife Priscilla because all the Jews were kicked out of Rome. This was an edict by Emperor Claudius. This is one of the reasons we know it was 51 AD that Paul was in the city of Corinth that year. Um, the reason Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome is because there were riots caused by followers of someone called Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. -E and that was Jesus. It was just a thing going on in the Jewish community, and Roman peace was so important to the Romans that the emperor certainly wasn't going to let any little riotous things go on in Rome. So he just kicked all the Jews out. They were a trouble to him that way. Claudius died around uh, three or four years after this, and the Jews returned to Rome. In fact, we'll read about that in Romans chapter 16. Um, you'll see that uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Paul writes in Romans 16, verses 3 and 4, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. And that's an interesting phrase, laid down their own necks means hazarded, their own necks. Um, that's important to keep in mind as we go through this. Pontus, I said it had to do with Acts chapter 2. Remember the day of Pentecost. There were Jews from all over the world there in Jerusalem. And geographically, all those places were named because in the context of Pentecost, 
It emphasized the different languages spoken by the pilgrims in Jerusalem on that day when the believers came out speaking in the languages of all those people and they'd never studied those languages. Pontus was in the area of what we would call today Turkey. It was up near the uh, Black Sea. And it's possible that Aquila was there in Jerusalem and got saved at Pentecost or, I mean, he was Jewish, or someone who got saved from Pontus, and we know they were there, brought the gospel back to town and um, Aquila got saved that. In any case, he and his wife were tent makers, like Paul, and they were traveling around working. Maybe it was more lucrative to be an itinerant tent maker than staying in one place because it was travelers who needed tents, not people who stayed put in one place. I don't know how the tent making business was in those days. Maybe they were just a couple who liked to travel. I know people who like to travel, and, and there have always been people who like to travel. Uh, maybe the Jews being expelled from Rome was the reason they began traveling. We don't know. We do know they traveled a lot. We They go back to Rome. They go to Ephesus. Uh, they probably had some money, or maybe they just uh, were so sold out for Jesus they chose not to invest in a home and all that. You know what home ownership is like. Um, and they decided to use their income to minister as led by the Holy Spirit, and he led them around the Roman Empire. A lot of things we don't know about them, but we do know that they love the Lord, and they were good friends with Paul. So they got kicked out of Rome because of Christianity. Now, some people will argue that, but you you know, the more we dig up from um, archaeology, the more we find out, the more history we learn. It's kind of interesting. A guy by the name of Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, who, <laughs> think about that, um, with a name like that, how are you tranquil? His name is Suetonius. They took his middle name. That He was a Roman secretary and historian, and he's famous in our era for the things he wrote. And he wrote during the imperial era of the Roman Empire. He was um, writing around this time. And his records say the Jews were expelled from Rome because of the near riots over this Cresto. And he wrote, and this happened around 49 to 50 AD when they get 50, 51. We know it was 51 when the edict was given. And Christians are mentioned explicitly by him when he writes his biography of Emperor Nero. Um, he, t he writes about the punishments uh, that Nero meted out during the Great Fire in Rome, which won't happen until 64 AD, 13 years after these events in Acts 18. And, um, and so we know a little bit about that. But anyway, Paul found Aquila, <laughs> just happened to be of the same trade as Paul, a tent maker <clears throat> in the same town and a believer here in Corinth. And there are no coincidences in God's kingdom. It's amazing who we meet, <coughs> excuse me, and the the camaraderie we have in this and the the things we have in common sometimes and you know it's a setup by the lord and because they were all tent makers priscilla and aquila who were established in their trade in their movements already somehow <clears throat> paul moves in with them and thus begins one of the most important friendships in the new testament paul with aquila and priscilla and Paul calls them his fellow workers, as I read in, in Romans 16, 3 and 4, who had risked their own necks for his life. Now, since only Roman citizens could be sentenced to decapitation, not that that's a great thing, but they did have some rights, um, this phrase might hint um, about death by decapitation, giving us a clue that Aquila and Priscilla were Roman citizens. Interestingly, it doesn't say that Priscilla was Jewish. It says Aquila was Jewish. She might have been, um, but her name is mentioned first frequently in the list of their names, which is unusual for the woman's name to be first. This, along with her actual name, Priscilla, might indicate she was from a well-known Roman family and was a Gentile because the name Priscilla is was Prisca, she's going to be called a, a nickname, was a, fa was a um, name in a strongly influential family in the Roman Empire at this time. We'll find Priscilla's name inscribed on the catacombs in Rome. There's a cemetery of Priscilla in Rome, <clears throat> which is one of the earliest Christian burial grounds. Just some interesting background there. But these guys worked because the Jewish rabbis had a saying, and it went something like this. This is not an exact quote, so forgive me. If you don't teach your son a trade, you teach him to be a thief. Um, and we find that when Paul... <clears throat> 
is writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9. He says this, And when I was present with you and wanted, I was in need, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me the brothers which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so I will keep myself. So it's, you know, Paul's trade came in handy because in accordance with the practice of many of the Jewish scribes and rabbis, now remember, not the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, <clears throat> sort of give a bad reputation to all Jewish rabbis of that era, and they weren't all bad guys. Um, many of the Jewish scribes and rabbis provided for them their own selves by trade, so they wouldn't be a burden on their congregations. And Paul kept that up. And he normally tried to um, care for and provide for his own material needs, so there wouldn't be any reason to be a... First of all, there wouldn't be a burden on the people to whom he was ministering, and there would be no reason for them to complain. So here we go. He's, he's of the same trade. He lives with them in verse 3. <clears throat> they were tent makers of verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now remember, the Jews, of course, are at the synagogue, but so are the God-fearing Greeks who worshipped with the Jews, learning about the one true and living God from the Jews. Not all of them converted to Judaism. Many of them just stayed Greek, didn't want to take the extra step of being circumcised or living under the Mosaic law. And Paul dialogued, this word reasoned is is the Greek word for dialogue. Do we get that our word dialogue from it? He dialogued in the synagogue with them about Messiah. And as was his um, habit, he used Old Testament prophecies, persuading, if you will, um, debating, answering questions, going back and forth, both the Jews and the devout Greeks, that Jesus was, in fact, the fulfillment of these prophecies. However, here in Athens, he wasn't as forward when he first got started in his testimony. We'll see that. Look at verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus, that's Timothy, were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. When Silas and Timothy arrive, remember he's been alone all this time. He was alone in Athens. He's alone now in Corinth for a little time, except for the friendships he made with Priscilla and Aquila, but he doesn't have his posse, his team, his buddies around him. <clears throat> Paul is compelled when they arrive all of a sudden there's a burning in his heart to testify that Jesus is the Messiah which infers that he had not yet been very strongly uh, he didn't debate as strongly about that before they arrived now he had left these two guys Silas and Timothy in Berea and Thessalonica to look after the young believers in those towns when he was run out of town and they finally reconnect with Paul here in Corinth. Another team member is still not with them. That's Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He's still back in Philippi, taking care of the church there. Well, anyway, Silas and Timothy bring really good news to Paul, that the believers in Thessalonica and Berea were moving ahead strongly in the Lord. It was great. I mean, Paul had been worried that the new believers in those towns would spiritually fall apart when, because they saw him being run out of town by mobs. After all, who would want to join a religion where everybody around you is going to chase you down and, and want to kill you? But um, he didn't have to worry because the Holy Spirit was involved. He's learning too. Anyway, Paul writes about this in his letter to the Corinth. In, in his letter, he will write from Corinth when he writes back to the Thessalonians. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, let me get back there real quick. Verses 3 through 8, he writes this. And this is what he writes about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. He said, um, I left uh, Timothy, our brother, with you to establish you in the faith that no man should be moved by the afflictions that I was going to go through. For yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and you know that. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor was in vain. But now when Timothy came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and love, 
and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brothers, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. So as we read through this, the epistles and compare it to what happened in the book of Acts, we see why Paul wrote some of the things he did. So this good news brought by Silas and Timothy was like a spiritual shot of B12 in the arm for Paul. Um, in fact, in Acts chapter 28, um, he talks of a time when uh, it was just one of those times when he was, it's the end of the book of Acts, and he says, and from there, when the brothers heard about us, they came to meet us as far as the Appii Forum and the three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Paul loved the fellowship of the believers. It always jazzed him. Well, these guys not only brought good news, they also brought an offering of money from the church at Philippi, which was great. And Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And when he writes back to the church at Corinth, verses 8 and 9, he wrote, I robbed other churches. He didn't mean highway robbery, of course. He was just saying, you guys didn't take any money from you. I took wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me. The brothers which came from Macedonia, Timothy and Silas, supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. So um, one of the benefits of the offering that came with Silas and Timothy was that this enabled Paul to do full-time preaching. Between working and preaching, he was wearing himself out. He was tired. He was worn out. He'd been chased out of several towns by mobs and almost killed a few times. Um, the guy, it, it, he was struggling. We'll talk about that today a little bit. Um, and he had been less forceful in preaching the the, the gospel before uh, these guys arrived. In fact, just before Timothy and Silas arrived, he was a little gun shy. He was not, he was cautiously tactful. Even though he wasn't timid, he was cautiously tactful. He wasn't foolish. I mean, he was alone because he was chased out of town by mobs. In fact, the Greek word pressed here in verse 5, uh, it means impelled or pressed on every side. It was used speaking of cattle that were pushed into on each side through a chute, forcing them into a position where they couldn't move so the farmer could give them medication. It's the idea of being, um, in a, for a, a word picture, of being compressed and swept up by a crowd. You can't do anything about it. The idea here in the context of the Greek is that Paul stopped tent making. He had to stop. He was compelled to just preach the gospel all the time now. And the Lord made that possible, brought the compulsion to him and the means by which to do it without having to work with his two buddies. And the Lord also appears to Paul because he was um, afraid. Paul was afraid. And the Lord encouraged him to continue to preach the gospel. It says here in verse 5, he testified. Uh, he was very strong now in his presentation of Jesus as the Messiah to the Jewish community. In verse 6, though, this is what happened. Typical. And when they, the Jewish people in that synagogue, opposed themselves and blasphemed, he, Paul, shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. Opposed themselves and blasphemed. The blasphemy must have been directed against Jesus because Paul preached Jesus as the Messiah. In verse 5, he testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. This is an indirect declaration, if you will, of the deity of Jesus because someone can only commit blasphemy against God. And he shakes his raiment. This was a typical Jewish thing showing complete rejection, like shake the dust off your feet. Even Jesus said to his guys to do that. It was a dramatic way of expressing his rejection of their rejection. Okay, you rejected Jesus, I'm going to reject you. And Paul was certainly an emotional guy and capable of dramatic and passionate displays of emotion. And he said, your blood be on your own heads. That's biblical terminology for judgment to come upon a person or a people group 
for something they had chosen or decided to do or not to do. And Paul is saying to them that in rejecting the Messiah, they have put themselves in a collision course with the judgment of God. And this is consistent with Scripture. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, but it is consistent with Scripture. Um, it's just the way it is. Jesus himself uh, talking about it. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's just standard, consistent Christian biblical theology. And then Paul says, for I am clean. I am clean. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33 in your Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 33. And we're going to read a few verses about this. Paul had done his part and done what the Lord had required of him. He was to preach the gospel. And in Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 6, it says this, And again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchmen, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that takes warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman sees the sword come and does not blow the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So Paul is using Old Testament idioms that they understand. My hands are clean. I'm in a watchman on the wall. I'm telling you the judgment of God is coming upon our nation, the Jews, because they've rejected the Messiah. You guys, I've explained to you from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. You've seen the proof. You know it's true. You know the story of Jesus of Nazareth because it's been a big deal. The rabbis had been from Jerusalem, had spread that word throughout the coast, especially once Paul came to faith in Christ and started debating and winning converts um, because of debating from the scriptures. And the Jews heard his warning, but they chose to get angry at the messenger who carried the warning. So in rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, in essence, they were cutting off their noses to spite their faces, because as Luke writes, anointed by the Holy Spirit, they oppose themselves, because the end result of rejecting Christ is choosing hell over heaven. There's no other way to get there. So Paul's hands were clean. He had been faithful to preach the gospel. In verse 7, he leaves. He says, I will go to the Gentiles. And he goes right next door. I love this guy. Verse 7, and he departed there and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. It was an adjacent building. It was like a row home in Philly. Maybe a little bigger, maybe a little smaller, but they were right next door to each other. They were touching Justice is his Greek name. He was He's, he's a, probably a Greek, a Gentile, who had attended the synagogue. He was a, um, a guy who worshipped God and came to faith in Jesus. And in this we see God's humor as well as his love in bringing the Jews and the Jewish believers face to face. The um, next door thing is, you know, like God saying, God, I'm not going away. Here I am. And Paul's not going away. He's going to be right next door while you guys are pulling your teeth out because of whatever he said to you. I'm going to move him right next door. And so when they were together on the same day, they had to walk past each other. And look what happens. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. The very chief ruler of the synagogue became a convert. The chief ruler was responsible for making sure the building was cared for and the services were held in a regular and orderly manner. This was a big deal. It would be like um, 
little old me going down to Philly and start preaching to uh, the archdiocese and the archbishop of the area coming to faith in Jesus and walking away from Rome. It was it, now, of course, that's a magnified position, but that's how big a position this guy held in the synagogue. The whole Jewish community in Corinth was disrupted. They had to find a replacement chief ruler now. Um, well, Paul had left off preaching to the Jews. Crispus comes to the Lord. But this shows that Paul treated the Jews of Corinth with love and grace, even after they rejected him and his message. He wasn't against them. They were against themselves, and they were against Paul and against Jesus, but he loved them. He shared the Lord. Crispus believed, and he welcomes him. He, he, he had to share it with Crispus. He was the one preaching. He certainly did not forbid Jewish people from coming to his meetings and hearing about the Lord. He merely switched the focus of his evangelism into the, uh, from the Jews to the Gentiles by predominantly speaking to the Gentiles. And all the people in Crispus' household came to faith. And later we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, when Paul's writing back and saying, hey, I'm, I'm glad I didn't baptize many of you. It says in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, um, verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. So Paul baptizes this guy. And that makes sense. Paul was a, a big cheese rabbi, and this was the um, former chief ruler of the synagogue. It made sense. And so the situation uh, starts to change. And with the conversion of Christmas, Crispus, it doesn't give us details between verse 8 and 9. But it seems the opposition uh, and situation became very dangerous for Paul. Look at verses 9 and 10. <coughs> Excuse me. Then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not your peace. For I am with you, and no man shall set on you to hurt you, for I have much people in this city. Wow, a vision of Jesus. Comforting words, be not afraid. Don't be silent, Paul. No one will hurt you. Jesus said it in Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. And he hasn't changed whether he's speaking to Paul in the first century or you and me today with whatever you're going through. But in this case, it was specifically for Paul. I'm with you, Paul. No one's going to hurt you. I have a lot of people in the city. Now, it's no surprise that Paul was fearful. He had suffered many physical persecutions, most of which are not recorded in the book of Acts. But he alludes to a lot of them. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, you will see Paul give a list of a bunch of the bad things, the heftier things that happened to them. We don't have records of all of them in the book of Acts. Some of the, those things in that list are recorded here, but not everything. But make no mistake, this was a time of crisis in Paul's ministry and personal life. He was tired. He was afraid and alone in Corinth before the guys got there. He had no fellowship with his other leadership guys who were of the same spirit and like mind. And even when they arrived, those feelings don't immediately disappear especially when the opposition in Corinth became more dangerous. And Paul knew it. He'd been in this circumstance and predicament before. He could sense if you are ever on a street and ever in a street circumstance in certain neighborhoods, you know when things are sort of, you got to be careful. You, it's like your radar is going up and the hair on the back of your neck stands up. Paul s sees all the signs. When this happened in these other cities, when the Jews came got this violent or this angry and, and he had to shake off the dust. This is when the, the persecution started to come to him. And Jesus' words indicate that Paul was afraid uh, or on the verge of leaving Corinth at this time. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Paul. Speak. It's okay. Don't hold your peace. Go ahead and talk. I'm with you. No man will hurt you, no matter if they come against you, because I have a lot of people in the city. And, you know, all of us can identify with Paul on some level in this. He was discouraged and lonely till Silas and Timothy got there. It was great that he met Priscilla and Aquila, but that was a new friendship that was just forming. How often do you feel kind of discouraged and alone, spiritually speaking, when you're not in fellowship with other believers? Heck, this online stuff is a bummer. I want to be face-to-face -face with you guys. I want to be able to hug you on Sunday morning or whenever we're together and, <clears throat> and look in your eyes and, and maybe have a cup of coffee with you before uh, service or after, have, have lunch or something. 
I mean, we talk about these online dinners and they're okay. And it was great to have it last week. Thank you for those of you who could make it. But I still wasn't the same as grabbing you by the shoulders and looking you in the eyes and, and letting you know that I do love you and, and seeing your affection for us. We miss you guys. Paul was also in financial need, which caused him to fall back on his trade. He was still called to do the work. Jesus hadn't yet appeared to him with this vision. He's afraid. He's alone. Um, and now he's got double the work he's got to do his work to support himself as well as preach because he's he is compelled to speak even though he doesn't have quite the compulsion that he will have uh, when the holy spirit touches his heart you know finances are a great discouragement to the people called to ministry 46 percent of pastors under the age of 45 say they are considering quitting full-time ministry um compared to 34 percent of pastors 45 and older who've been with it long enough saying oh what the heck only one in three pastors is considered healthy in terms of well-being when you measure how a person is emotionally and these figures are from before covid this isn't after covid it got a little worse except for the pastors who who did quit and the ones who um, uh, became woke if you will and wandered from the word of god but with all of that thank god for his faithful followers because with all of those percentages, only 1.5% of guys actually leave the ministry every year. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, there are great numbers that you hear and, and studies that you see, oh, 1,500 pastors a month fall into sin and leave their churches. Hogwash. They, they, they say their Barna um, research found out and folks on the family published these things. Well, you do the research, you can't find those studies. There's no such study out there. When you do the research... Only one and a half men actually leave the ministry every year. Thank God for these guys with stickability. Because it isn't easy sometimes. Up to Corinth, Paul had the option of preaching full time. He could have done it. But when he had the option, he sometimes chose to work. However, in Corinth, he was forced to work. And you know how depressing the stress of financial pressure can be, whether you're in ministry or not. You add to that, the persecution was beginning to wear him down. He had to walk everywhere and get out of town on a boat and get snuck out at night, especially since most of the persecution came from his own people, the Jews. Not receiving encouragement from our own tribe is often the most discouraging feeling in the world. And now <clears throat> he finds himself in Corinth, a city that was absolutely decadent. That was spiritually depressing. <clears throat> I say that to you with words. But words are far worse than, uh, the, the situation was far worse than words that I can tell you conveys. History tells us that the immorality in Corinth shocked the decency of even the pagans who lived there. And the pagans were really immoral by comparison to the Jews. The Jews were very righteously living. And we've, we felt that in our city with our church. <clears throat> we felt it at times in the neighborhood around the church. The break-ins and the thefts of church equipment were discouraging because we didn't have much and we couldn't afford to replace it. The prostitutes who worked the corner in front of our church building on Sunday mornings. I even offered one fifteen dollars to come to church one day so she would make her money. Just come in off the corner and and and, and come to church. Well, you shouldn't have to pay me. That's not right, she said. I said, yeah, I know, but it's not right you hooking for... Uh, for John's out here on Sunday morning either. Just come in. I'll give you the 15 bucks if you need the money. Then there's the violence and the murders. We we got them in our neighborhood. We lit, Our church is in the zip code where the numbers of children whose pa parents are incarcerated is the biggest in the city. There was a body found buried in the lot behind our church. Our zip code has the number of police who were murdered and this is the greatest number of police murdered in the city by bad guys. And all of this can really get us down, and we wonder if we're making any impact at all. And we add to that <clears throat> the opposition from the city that's prevented us from obtaining our certificate of occupancy for the building. And, and I wonder, did God really call me to do this? And yet I know he has. So what did Paul do? Well, he made new friends. He had Priscilla and Aquila, and they were Jewish. At least Aquila was for sure. So that was good. He found stress relief in working with his hands as he plied his trade with the tent making. He loved preaching on the Sabbath. It seemed to raise his spirits. I can tell you, every pastor I know who's spirit-filled can't wait to preach the word on Sunday morning. 
it just jazzes them no matter how tired they are what's going on in their life it's been whatever the week was at the end of sunday service they feel so great because they got to share god's word then tim tim and silas arrive and they brought financial relief which enabled him to devote himself more to full-time ministry and they brought the encouraging word that the church in thessalonica was doing well so he hears that oh yeah there was an impact on what i did and so he has a little hope for what might happen in Corinth. And then he receives a vision of Jesus, which is restored, I guess, his assurance in Jesus' presence and power. But it, Jesus' words at the end of that verse are what intrigued me. Jesus said, I have much people in this city. Well, were there already that many believers in Corinth? Or were the people Jesus talking was talking about his sheep who had not yet heard his voice. I have many sheep who have not yet heard my voice. Whenever we share the truth of the gospel, we are speaking for the Lord. He wants people to hear the, the gospel. We don't have to say, thus saith the Lord, when we tell them about Jesus. Jesus said it. Tell them. Preach the gospel to every creature. And people hear the voice of their shepherd in the gospel message we carry. Back in Acts chapter 13, verse 48. Do you remember that? <clears throat> Acts 13, verse 48. When the Gentiles heard, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Paul preached the word of the Gentiles, and those who God knew would accept him believed. And this is going to be the same in Corinth. You share the word of God, people who are destined to hear it will believe. It doesn't... Now, Divine election, I'm not going to talk about predestination, but it doesn't mean God has chosen some people to be saved and other people not. It's just that he knows ahead of time who's going to. That's what that's talking about. But I love Jesus' cure for Paul. Man's cure for fear and concern would likely be like this. Paul, take a vacation. Don't do work that stresses you out. Find something you like to do. But Jesus' solution for Paul was this. Paul, obey the calling I put on your life. Get to work doing the very things that are causing you fear and concern. I love that. What a difference between the, Lord, the Lord's wisdom and the world's wisdom. And the result of Paul following the Lord and being obedient is that there was a church founded in Corinth. And while he's here for these 18 months, he will write First and Second Thessalonians back to the church in Thessalonica. It says much people. <clears throat> Many Corinthians did accept Jesus during the year and a half that Paul was there. Yet it's significant to me, and it jazzes me, that the Lord already knew them and regarded them as his own people even before they came, became believers. Isn't that cool? He knew you before you became a believer in me, before I became a believer. And he knew it was going to happen. And he allowed the circumstances that happened to us in our life, good and bad, to get our souls to the point where we could make the free choice by our own will, just like the Corinthian believers made the free choice based on their own will. All the things in our lives that brought us to that point where we heard the gospel and were ready to accept the Lord. Now, we had to make the choice for him or against him. And those of us who did are not sorry that we did. But the Lord had already prepared them through the circumstances and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So verse 11 says they were, he was there a year and six months, 18 months, teaching the word of God among them. I love that he taught the word of God. He wasn't just preaching sermons that came out of the word of God. He taught the word of God. He didn't teach from the word of God. He taught the word of God. Now let's go on to, from 12, verse 12, I guess we'll stop at verse 17. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O you Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, Look, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of these things. And so we get an interesting thing going on.
Paul with his stick ability stays and preaches. And here they are. Um, Corinth was the capital of that head, that province of Achaia. And that was like southern Greece, Macedonia. And this guy Gallio was the proconsul. He was the deputy there. Gallio was an interesting guy. He, uh, he was another one of those huge Latin names, Lucius, Junius, Gallio, Ananias, Anianus, or something like that. Um, sorry if that sounded like a body part. The, his original name, um, he was probably about oh, 55 or 60 years old now. He was the older brother of a guy whose name you know, a playwright and philosopher whose name was Seneca. So it even brings the arts into the Bible study today. See that? And he changed his name to Gallio from Lucius Novatus because he was adopted by a senator by the name of Junius Gallio. Uh, when Claudius became the emperor, uh, some years before uh, he kicked the Jews out of Rome, he had Seneca, the younger brother of Gallio, exiled to the island of Corsica. And Gallio went with him. He, he went into exile with his brother Seneca. Seneca, uh, Seneca fell into disfavor with um, the emperor's wife. Um, her name was Messalina. Italian girls, don't mess with them, right? And these two brothers, well, apparently she got on the bad side of her husband. He got a new wife. And her name was Agrippina. She was uh, Agrippina the Younger. And she liked Seneca. So Seneca and his brother were called out of exile just a few years before this event. In fact, she chose Seneca to be the tutor to Nero. That's why she called him out. He, was a, he had a great reputation of being a kind, gentle man, a very intelligent guy. So anyway, these in, events involving Paul and Corinth occurred when Gallio here was the deputy of Ikea, which was 50, 51 and 52 AD, from 51 to 52. That's why we know when this events happened here in the book of Acts. And at that time, the provincial officials in Rome kept out of the conflicts between the Jews and the Christians. Um, it was just a hassle to them. And eventually, Gallio will be promoted from consul, or from proconsul to consul. But after Nero forces Seneca to commit suicide when he finally becomes the emperor, uh, Gallio also committed suicide with his brother. And those crazy Italians, you got to look at it. Anyway, this helps us date the uh, events here. Paul was having great success persuading the Jews during this 18 months that Jesus was the Messiah. And this prompted the non-believing Jews to drag him to the judgment seat. And they make these charges against Paul. He persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, it was illegal to do certain things religiously from a religion standpoint in Rome, um, in the Roman Empire. But he wasn't promoting a religion that was going against Rome. So it was okay. It wasn't, there was no legal ruling yet saying Christianity was illegal. It was not yet acceptable, but it had not yet been ruled illegal. And their charge seems a little vague because it was a purposeful deceit in order to get Gallio to use the weight of Roman law to punish Paul, just like the Jews in, in Jerusalem did with Pontius Pilate and Jesus. But Paul was a Roman citizen and he knows his rights. He knew exactly what he could and could not do. And as he hears the charges against him, and he's about to offer his defense before he could defend himself, it says in verse 14, now Paul is about to open his mouth, Gallio spoke up. The very proconsul there speaks up. Gallio speaks up and defends him. I love it. He didn't know what he was doing in the sense of defending Paul. I think Gallio saw through the Jews' ruse. He knew what they were going to do. He, correct, he correctly says, that the government has no role at all in attempting to decide religious matters. Although the government does have a legitimate role in matters of wrongdoing or wicked crimes. The people in Washington ought to take heed of this, by the way. In any case, here he's about ready to make a ruling. And, and these Jews had brought all these charges against Paul, this, this fake charge. And Gallio says, if it's a question of words and names and of your law, they, he heard them, oh, he's, he's promoting this Jesus, the new king who's going to go against Rome, and he's, a new, he's not our God, and blah, blah, blah. He says, if it's names and 
words and your law, you take care of it. I'm not going to be a judge of such matters. The Roman uh, leaders didn't want to have anything to do with these little matters that had to do with religion. But Jesus' words we see here, his prophetic words to Paul, are quickly fulfilled. Remember what he said back in verses 9 and 10. Don't be afraid. Speak. Don't hold your peace. So Paul does it. <clears throat> but Jesus says, For I am with you, and no man shall set on you to hurt you. Well, here they've set on him, but they didn't hurt him. They couldn't hurt him. No one could hurt Paul because Paul was being protected by Jesus. Gallio's smart. He's an arbiter of Roman law, not religious law. This, this particular event was very beneficial for the church in the first century. Gallio, in essence, is saying that Christian he didn't use these words, but in ruling this way by proclamation, without having to say it, he's saying that the Christians share the same protection by Roman law as Judaism, as the Jews. And this was a pre precedent set for all the other judges in that whole province of Icaia because it came from the headquarters and right from the ruler. Gallio was a family which was very influential for, in Rome. This Roman senator who adopted Gallio, and that's why he changed his name. If Gallio had accepted the Jewish charge and found Paul guilty of these alleged crimes, um, the provincial governors everywhere would have had a precedent and and Paul's ministry would have been restricted and the Christians would have been locked up. But Gallio's refusal to act in the matter was tantamount to a recognition of Christianity as religio licita, a legal religion. So Christianity was safe for a while until Nero married this gal by the name of Papia Sabina and she converted to Judaism. That's when the trouble began for the Christians. See all that history we didn't like in school? You probably don't like it today either. Sorry, you got to put up with me. Anyway, verse 16 says, And he drave them from the judgment seat. Get out of there. He had those, I guess the guards got rid of them. <clears throat> and it says in verse 17, Then the Greeks, all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio didn't care for it. Sosthenes was the replacement ruler of the synagogue after Crispus became a believer and lost his job. I wonder if when Sosthenes got the job, he thought, Wow, I've always wanted to be the ruler of the synagogue. But now, this day, he's thinking, oh man, I am not glad I'm the ruler of the synagogue. Um, in any case, in rejecting the Jews' complaint, um, this gave the pagans, these Greeks, an excuse to vent their anti-Semitic hostility by beating Sosthenes. The Jews were hated even then. This is demonic. So Gallio looks the other way, and the angry Gentiles beat Sosthenes, um, and probably both the crowd and Gallio himself were more against the Jews than they were for Paul. It was just a matter of who they didn't like that day. But at some point, here's the cool thing. Sosthenes becomes a, a believer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, he joins Paul in addressing the letter back to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Yes, I love it. I love it. So first Crispus, then Sosthenes. Boy, God wanted those synagogue rulers. You know what? He wants you just as bad. And that's what's in this for us. Verse 8 says that many of the Corinthians hearing believed. They believed when they heard the gospel. Not that Paul was out there turn or burn, but he might have been. He was saying, Jesus is the Messiah, and he talked to them, he reasoned to the, with the people from Scripture. And we know what the Bible says, what God's Word says. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Not hearing the Word of God, but hearing by the Word of God. And that doesn't make sense to a natural mind, a logical sense in human thought. That a person can believe simply by hearing the gospel or hearing God's word. But God is infinitely wiser than man. And he made it that way for a reason. When Paul writes back to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, he says this. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. What would a person do if they had to become a theologian in order to understand and accept salvation? How many people could be saved? What if a person could not read? What if a person was blind? What if a person was 
a paraplegic and couldn't get to school? What if a person was deaf? Back in all these centuries before we had all these accommodations and, and great ways to reach people with handicaps, they would never heard the gospel. And hearing is more than the sense of hearing. This Greek word here in verse 8, it means perceiving and understanding the thing heard. Deaf people can understand. Just as a person who cannot read can understand, that's cognition. The rich can't keep understanding the gospel from the poor because it's not a material thing. It can be heard and accepted. Children can understand and accept it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I've been, and I'm doing this because we're in Corinth now with Paul. Verses 26 through 31, Paul writes back, For you see your calling, brothers, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, he says to the people in Corinth, the basest city in the Roman Empire, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to nothing things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. And in chapter 6 of that same letter to the Corinthians, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians, verses 9, 10, and 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. There's a lot of people listed there. But, then he adds, and such were, past tense, some of you, but you are now present tense washed, but you are now present tense sanctified, but you are now present tense justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And it's all the work of God that he could write this to people who were residents of and former participants in the sin of the most sinful city in the Roman Empire. And in that atmosphere, the church grew, a church grew. They were not many wise or mighty or noble people in that congregation. They were sinners just like you and me. And if you think you're not as bad as they were because you weren't in a city as bad as Corinth, then you don't understand sin. All the results of Paul's ministry, because he was obedient. And yet as great a servant as Paul was, what would he have accomplished alone? He needed Aquila and Priscilla. He needed Silas and Timothy and justice. He needed the believers in Macedonia who sent him finances. He needed Luke, the doctor, who took care of him at times and wrote Acts and tended to him. The work of the church, reaching lost with the gospel, is the work of all believers, every one of us, whether we ever have a pulpit or ever get an opportunity like Paul. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what you've taught us in your word and the examples you've given us.